I, I don't have much time to do to tell this story, so I'm going to keep it as brief as I can. Um, first and foremost, it's to be on this stage with some of the greatest chefs in the, in, in the world, some of the best rugby players in the world, entrepreneurs, to talk about mental health shows you how far we've actually come to normalizing this conversation. And I thought to myself when I was asked to do this, going, what the hell would I be doing on this stage talking about this? But then I thought about professional rugby players, chefs, entrepreneurs, probably the top three people who struggle, but never say anything about it. So for me, Ireland has come so far. I don't think a lot of people are, realize it because we always assume we're this kind of conservative, backward country. But it feels like over the years, of being repressed. We've held back this big elastic band and let the tension build up and build up and build up and build up. And it's like we've just released it. And there's this outpouring. People are, are finally speaking. People are coming up to me in pubs and telling me their stories. Uh, the one big thing I was told, the biggest word of advice I was given, and I've spoken to corporates, teenagers, universities, you name it, I've spoken to everybody. But the best advice I was given was by the uh, Cycle Against Suicide entrepreneur, Jim, Bur uh, Jim Breen, who said, when you're doing this, Niall, never, never, ever try to tell anyone else's story. Tell your own story. That's where the power is. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it really, really brief. I'm not going to elaborate. Uh, I'm not going to go into Oprah Winfrey motivation bullshit. I'm just going to keep it brief and hopefully round it off at a point at the end of it. As a 15-year-old, I was achieving, I was doing well. I was captain of my school football team. I was doing okay in school for a thick prick. Um, but I'd go home to bed and at night and I'd rip my duvet apart choking. I couldn't breathe, could not breathe, couldn't sleep. I was an insomnia. I hadn't slept for weeks upon weeks as a 15 year old. My hair was falling out. I went to doctors thinking I had asthma, thinking I had appendicitis, all these kind of crazy things, anything, because I hadn't a clue what this was. Uh, I went to my first GP at the time, he's not my GP anymore for obvious reasons, who told me it was puberty. And, uh, you know, you kind of, it's a doctor, you're going to believe him, so it's puberty. The reason I'm choking and ripping my duvet apart is because I'm going through puberty. I know it's bad, it's not that fucking bad. <laughs> and then this went on, and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. So much to the point that I got so frustrated. I was just turned 16 and I strapped my left arm to, to uh, a chair beside my bed. And I took my right arm and I smashed it against the side of the bed until I felt every bone break in my forearm. Until I felt the bone coming out of my forearm. Out of pure frustration. But I was relieved because I felt if I went into the doctor or into the hospital where I get my arm fixed, they would tell me what was wrong with me. So I went in. First and foremost, I said, your arm's fucked. I went eight years in college. Brilliant. Um, and he disappeared and he came back and I built myself up. I said, I'm going to tell him. And he walked in. He was a foreign guy. And I looked at him and I showed him my arm. I said, I did that to myself. And he looked me in the eye and he said, it's puberty. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, when I left that hospital and my mother was in the car park, I thought of the three different ways I could take my own life. Out of pure fear and terror, because I didn't know what was wrong with me. I hadn't slept in nearly a year. But I was achieving. I was getting better at sport. I was starting to represent Leinster in rugby. I was, you know, all these things were going well because I was using sport. It was the only antidote and medication I had for what this was and I couldn't tell my family. That's what was so difficult about this. So this bred and it bred so much so I started getting very acutely depressed to the point where I couldn't even leave the house. I couldn't function. I couldn't, when I, when I finished school, I'd run down the railway track. I'd hide under the piano at home if anyone knocked on the door. This went on for years. And this wasn't something a 15-year-old should ever, ever have to go through, or a 16-year-old. It was pure terror. So much so that I was breaking my own arm. So this went on to college. And the thing with mental health and depression and anxiety issues, you always feel the next step will be better. And when you get around that corner, everything will be okay. It doesn't work that way. It follows you. And I went to college. I dropped out first year. I couldn't walk into a lecture hall. I couldn't walk into a room. Like, I'm here speaking in Borgosh Energy Theatre to God knows how many people about mental health. When I was 18 or 19, I, I used to lock myself in the toilet in UCD, literally shaking and having panic attacks. And I, had to, I dropped out of college. So at this point, I had just got a scholarship to play rugby in UCD. 
I played rugby for the Irish under 21s. All this insane stuff was happening. People were saying, Jesus, he's flying. It's great. I was in absolute hell. Hell. Dropped out of first year. Became a professional rugby player. And I remember when I signed the deal, you know, you, your parents are going, this is brilliant. It's the best thing that ever happened. I felt nothing. At this point, it was on medication. Everyone around me was aware of how bad it was getting. I got to start playing with Leinster, and the big thing with rugby, and you know, Jamie here, absolute hero, but the big thing with rugby is the first word you hear when you hear the word rugby is you hear the word, you think the word macho. Oh, it's a real manly sport. No way could I go to my coach or my doctor to tell them I was deeply, deeply depressed and also couldn't function, couldn't breathe, couldn't sleep, hasn't, having a panic attack every single night. Couldn't tell them this. So every Monday morning, we'd go into our team doctor and we'd have to say, like, you know, give them some kind of injury. You'd say, oh, whatever. You'd make something up anyway, every Monday. And I'd die in my bed Sunday because I'm going to tell him on Monday. I'm going to tell him what I'm going through. I have to tell him. And I'd get into the doctor's office and I'd take a deep breath. And then I'd say, oh, I fucked up my finger or something. I'd make something up. But I never could tell him. And I met that doctor eight years later and I told him that and he cried. And I went, yeah, I appreciate the tears, but if I told you and you told my coach, would my coach have judged me? And he went, yes, he would have. So that's where we were back then. Just purely, people in the press, when I said I retired, I retired because I, had, I was injured. I was retired because I couldn't function. I couldn't function. I could not be a professional rugby player. Two days before my first cap at Leinster, I was in my uh, apartment in UCD, and the only thing I can describe it, I wanted to rip my own skin off my face. And I was banging my head, genuinely physically banging my head against the wall to try and knock myself out because I couldn't face playing the match because I was so acutely depressed. So I rang the coach and the, the doctor, I said, I can't do it. I said, I've got food poisoning. So they sent somebody up to have a look. And I did that thing you do in school, you know, that made your mouth all dry, got as hot as I could, said, yeah, he's fucked. He can't play and I, that's, I said to myself, I have to stop. I can't do this anymore. So I retired. And I went on to the next logical thing a professional rugby player does. And I went into music with my school friends, my very, very close school friends who were pretty aware of, of my background and my life. And it was, it, was, it was pretty good. And people would always say, with you know, general anxiety disorder, getting on stage, it must be a disaster. That's where I'm most comfortable. Getting up here is it's a piece of cake. If I miss a phone call, I'm on the floor having a panic attack. That makes no sense. So the music was what it was. And I have to keep this brief. I could tell you loads of little antidotes about where things really didn't go very well. But I moved to London. And I had what I can only describe probably my first breakdown. And people talk about breakdowns. They're like, Jesus, I'm stressed and work. That's not a breakdown. A breakdown is when nothing but madness goes on in your head. Nothing. You can't look at your own mother. Somebody came in and told you that your father was killed in a car crash. You couldn't feel anything. I know that's hard to hear, but it's important you get the message here. And I know there's a large majority of people in this room who deal with this. So what ended up happening is I was in London. I was going to meet my, my, my flatmate. And I was walking up the road, and it was literally, and this had never happened to me before, as if the lights were turned out. It was a beautiful, sunny, summer's day in London. The lights were turned out, and I cannot describe what happened. I walked to the park beside her house, and I lived there for two days. I could not face the world. I could see London, like, in the kind of horizon, and I felt safe because I knew there was this big, massive gap between me and people. I knew at this point that I was deeply in trouble. I was highly addicted to sleeping pills. I was on 400 milligrams of antidepressants. I was barely able to function and I got a phone call at this point. Perfect timing. Ask me would I like to be a coach on The Voice of Ireland. I was in a perfect condition to do it. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, once again I said, new avenue, it'll all be grand. Flew over to Ireland and it was okay. It was, you know, it was good to be home because it was close to my family. I got to, you know, see my mum every weekend. That was a huge comfort. But the, this is where the story changes, and I'll be as fast as I can telling you this. The third live show of the, of the Voice, I remember getting the knock on the door, quarter past six, 
get your mic, get Silas stage, we're going live. There was eight, you know, 700,000 people watching it. Our producers say 800,000, but I think they're talking shite. Um, 700,000 people watching it. And as Hanako came in the door, little did our stage manager know that I was having, to this day, the most powerfully profound panic attack I've ever had. I was on the floor, my ears were ringing, I was vomiting, I was choking. It felt like I was drowning. It felt I couldn't swallow my own saliva, and I was drowning. It was terror. My shirt was ripped, and those of you who don't know much about television, men wear makeup on television. So I looked like a girl who just got dumped at the Debs. My face was covered in shit black all over the place it wasn't a good look and I walked out the dressing room the knock I had to dig so deep I don't know how anyone in this room's had a panic attack knows that it takes absolute weeks to get over one I had five minutes and I walked out onto stage and the only person that was there for my comfort was Keen Egan and I was like I'm fucked how is this gonna and they were like he was like Breds what's going on with your face and I wanted to go to him Keen I've just had the most profound panic attack I've ever had I've struggled with depression anxiety all my life but I just went oh I just you know oh whatever and I couldn't tell him and I walked out and I walked past Catherine Thomas live stream and I looked at her please don't please please don't talk to me I need to get through this first 15 minutes I shook in my seat had a break ran out and in the in the in the dressing room there was uh, my phone and it was a text from my mother and she goes are you okay and I went no I really am it and that was the lowest I'd ever gone and I went home that night to the hotel, home to the hotel. I went to the hotel that night and I promised myself that this was going to change. And that was the changing point in my entire life. And here's what I did. This is my story, remember. This isn't what you all should do if you're struggling like this. This is my story. I gave my depression and anxiety a name. I humanized it. I decided to fight back. I gave it the worst name I could think of, and I know I'm going to offend someone in this room whose name is Jeffrey with a J, but I gave his name, I call him Jeffrey. Is there any Jeffreys here? Thank fuck. It's a terrible name. It's a terrible name. <clears throat> so uh, I gave it a name, and I decided I was gonna come up with a game plan. And part of my game plan was physical health. Because I knew when I played rugby and I played sport, it was the one thing that kind of made me feel normal. So I decided to, one thing I used to do, and here's a tip, right? Two o'clock every night, I'd have a panic attack, every night. I'd wake up, I'd get a sore throat. Within five minutes, I was on the floor, couldn't move. So what I started doing was put a pair of runners beside my bed. And every time I felt my throat get sore when I woke up, before I even had time to think, I put on the runners and I'd run. I was like Forrest Gump. I would just run and run and run and run. And I did that every night. And, this, and the 14 days into this, every night, I ran 39 kilometers in the middle of the night in a pair of shorts. And I knew everyone at home in Mullingar was looking, Breslin is at it again. Crazy bastard. And here was I was just like a gazelle running through the streets. And I got home that night, like shaking with tiredness. The next morning... Or the next day, I went to bed, and I woke up at 8 a.m. the next morning, and I went, what, what, oh my God. And I just thought to myself, I didn't have a panic attack. This is, a, this is incredible, like this is the breakthrough for me. I have never, ever, ever had a panic attack at night again. And I started to realize, maybe I do have an element of control here. So I decided to take on other things. One of my other issues was I had a massive phobia of water, huge phobia, and I knew Jeffrey hated water too. I knew he hated it, so I said, I'm going to, fucking throw you into the water now and you're going to hate it <laughs> and so I learned to swim I'm like the hardest thing I've ever done I learned to swim and my first open water swim my first open water swim in Dunleary and this is a story that my mother had to read in the press and it's just not a cool story but it's it's funny all the same I, I can live with it but the guy swimming me looked at me and said Brezzy just so you know before we go out swimming the seals are getting really confused with the, the swimmers in wetsuits and they're you know they're mating at the moment and so if a seal comes anywhere near you, just slap its tail. And I went, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I'm going to get sexually assaulted by a seal <laughs> and I have to swim in open water. <laughs> so I got into the water. I just, I just, I'm too, I'm just too stubborn. I got into the water and I think I did an Olympic record 2K swim <laughs> around Dunleary Harbour, the quickest thing you've ever seen. And I got out of the water and I looked at my mate and said, I didn't see any seals. He goes, Brezzy, there are no seals. And then I had to read, 
I said this in an interview, and, and someone put in the press, and my mum sent me the message, she goes, I'm so proud, son. It said, Brezzy feared Seal was going to have sex with him. <laughs> you, will, you won't beat that headline. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, that headline won't be beaten. And she was proud. But I learned to swim, and then I decided I was going to take something else on. What else did Jeffrey not want, want to do? I decided to do a to, to, uh, 70.3 Ironman. And I put it all together, and I started realizing something. At this point, it was important that I stopped hiding it from the public. Part of my job, like it or not, is that you're in the public eye. It's a big part of your life. And I was on my hands and knees as a 15-year-old, begging for somebody to come out and say I wasn't insane, that this was normal. And no one ever did. And I promised myself, if I ever got to the point that I could be that person for a potential teenager who's going through the same, that I wasn't going to look it up. I was going to be that person. And I decided to tell the press and the public. And I thought I was going to lose my job. I thought all these crazy, irrational thoughts that people with general, generalized anxiety disorder think. It's all irrational. I told the press and the public support was the greatest feeling I've ever had. To know that, number one, people appreciated it, but also that since when I told the public, that was the last obstacle. And as soon as everybody in my life knew, my peers, my colleagues, my friends, the public, my parents, I was only then able to start discovering how to deal with it. Only then, when I had stopped disguising it. And yet, there's thousands upon hundreds of thousands of men and women in this country who still disguise it. And if you disguise it and hide it and are ashamed of it, you will not be able to find a way out. And that's a hard thing to say, but it's the truth. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not a weakness. And in fact, if you use it right, it can be an edge. You can do a 2K swim with a seal trying to rape you <laughs> in like 20 minutes. It becomes an edge. Use it to motivate you. That's the thing. But if you become ashamed of it, you won't seek help. And when you seek help, you'll realize there's so much empathy out there. There's so much support. And I'm not putting bells and whistles on it. It's still hard as fuck to deal with. It really is. I still go to bed at night and have to spend 15 minutes trying to get my breath in order. It's just part of my life. Some people have IBS. Some people have arthritis. Some people have physical issues. I have a mental issue, but I can live with it and I can deal with it and I can manage it because everybody around me knows about it. And I'm not ashamed of it. And that's where we have to get. And I'll tell you straight out, putting some, you know, I have to say, for, you know, Tenile and Love in Dublin, for putting me on this stage to talk about this, you know, this is where we're getting in Ireland. The media have to get more involved. They have to. And they're doing a good job, but like I'm being asked to do radio interviews about mental health and I'm given two minutes. I can't speak. You can speak about property prices for 55 minutes in your fucking radio show, but you won't talk about depression for two minutes. That's not helping anyone. We've got to make real changes. So... So all I'm going to say is we've heard this word stigma a lot. It's the word that we're, we're hearing the most. And the point I just want to make before I finish up, up, my life became so much brighter, so much more dealable with everything that I went through when everybody knew about it. Genuinely, when I got it all off my shoulders, only then could I seek real, real help. And I, it was the seventh or eighth journey I went on that was the one that worked. I, bet I meditated, I was medit meditation, medication, you name it, I did everything. But it was a combination of a few of them. And it was seven or eight years of looking before I found it. And now I can say I've got relative control over my own mind. And you look at something like the internet as well. And last point, for every problem the internet creates, there's a hundred solutions. And we talk about teenage mental health. And we talk about putting adverts on TV and, you know, radio. They don't listen to TV, or don't watch TV, and they don't listen to radio anymore. It's all online. It's all technical. Why aren't we developing apps? Why aren't we developing online content that not only supports them, but protects them? Because we know it can be a dangerous place, but there has to be someone out there with a brain to pull this together. It certainly isn't me. But I just think, at this point, we are normalizing this conversation. And there's, what, a couple, you know, 1,200 people in this room. It's about magnifying. It's about you going and telling your mates and work tomorrow about this. It's about you going and telling your parents. And I know there's somebody in this room, or quite a lot of people in this room, who are dying to talk, just dying to do it. Do it. Telling you. Because although it's still difficult, 
you will find so much empathy. Thanks a million. Welcome to the oversized couch. That's ridiculous. Yeah, no, try that end. It's Ew, actually comical. What kind of freak yeah. would fit? Well, I'd probably fit now. <laughs> Debatable. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody for having the courage to be so open and honest about this because it is an issue that's been kept quiet and kept hidden for far too mm. long. So genuinely, thank you for that, no honestly. No you. You spoke about your impetus for actually sort of wanting to start sharing your story about, the, you know, that if there was a 15-year-old boy out there feeling the same way as you, and we know that there are many of them, um, it's, uh, it's far too upsetting hearing about the level of suicides in our country. So from the point of view of the organizations that you're working with, um, with AWARE, the Cycle Against Suicide, is there something that we can all do to help support other than giving what? money? Well, the big thing in Ireland is we, we hear the word mental health services and all this. And I, I mean, there, it's important that we start, obviously, funding that relative to the absolute epidemic that is going on in this country at the moment. But the fact is society and the media have so much power here. And I made this point, and I'll make it one more time. If we can make the Kardashians relevant, the media can make the Kardashians relevant. You can show the power they could potentially have with mental health. They could actually, you know, really get their teeth into it. There's no point in putting documentaries on policies and statistics. People going through acute depression couldn't give a shit. They want ways of dealing with it. They want to know other people are dealing with it. And I think until our media truly get involved with it and don't just kind of pay it, you know, you have a social responsibility to talk about mental health because everyone's, you know, bollocks. You have a, you have a responsibility to put real programming on it. And it's that, you know, we have Operation Transformation, we have Every second show is about obesity. Every second show is about losing weight. Where's the show about mental health? Do you think the problem is the fact that it's invisible? And so, the, you know, we, we don't, we know that cancer exists. You don't question somebody with cancer and say, ah, sure, suck it up, ah, you're a bit low, you know, you don't you know, steal the nerve. But there is that sort of environment around depression and mental illness, that thing of, you know, they just, you know, they're just, you know, they need to suck it up. But and that's, that's it's, a, which is horrific. That's a generational thing, you know, and, you know, up until 1996 in this country, if you committed suicide, you weren't allowed to be buried in the graveyard because it was a cardinal sin. That's the bollocks that we had to go through. And, and, you know, that takes a long time, a long time. And changing attitudes in the country is an incredibly difficult thing to do because you've got so many de demographics with all different opinions, different places. And I know there's people in Ireland who truly go, ah, would you stop, you know? And, and, and I'll be straight up, it's usually in, in the kind of the older demographics. I think the younger generation are starting to realize this is important. We've got, I got made to spend more money on gym memberships in their cars than they do in their brain. It makes no sense to me. You know, you can, you can look as good as you want, you can drive as fast as you want, your head's in the wrong place, and I've proven that. It's no fun. There's a sort of a general sentiment amongst friends that the healthiest people we know are the ones that have had counseling, you know? It's well, counseling, like, one of the best things I had was cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and it's actually very, very fast. And AWARE actually have a, a group cognitive, cognitive therapy thing that they can bring into schools, into corporates. And most of the talks that I've done this year, I've been in corporate companies. And you're going, like, you know, you're going to a place like Vodafone or Aviva, and you're speaking about mental health, and the CEOs there are going, this is on the agenda now, this is important. And if I was a boss of a major company or an entrepreneur, this would be something I'd very much be putting on the agenda, because if your staff believe you truly give a shit, They'll work hard for you. Yeah, well, here's to that. Thank you so much. Seriously, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it.